is, is awake too, fantastic. I did it say that. <laughs> oh, well you just said it, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome to uh, the last day of uh, AIA 2014. Um, so we've got another exciting day um, ahead of us, um, but this is our last morning. And we had a memorable banquet yesterday, so thank you to the local organisers. Who went beyond the call of duty actually by taking a whole bunch of people to Beale Street afterwards and organizing, like greasing the hand of one of the bus driver to take us there. So, <laughs> yes? Did we drink all the beer? Um, I don't know. John, when you left, you didn't have a beer in your hand, so I guess yes. The is yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you as well for go Where is Gord? Ah, hello, Gord. Thank you for the memorable uh, saga that you've uh, that you've said, and we have to have uh, the the, um, the electronic version of it so that people can make sure they didn't miss any of these uh, long events that you described. That was very funny. Okay, so um, before we get started this morning, I just want to do a couple of announcements. So uh, the conference navigator, the iPhone app. Uh, has finally, Apple has finally uh, updated the version. <laughs> so you can download it from iTunes and uh, you can uh, rely on it today to be there at the right time on the right day. Uh, so do that. And a reminder, we already said it yesterday, but there was a, a little uh, mistake in the, in the booklet about the 10.45 uh, afternoon session, which should be 1.45. Um, so if you haven't noted that, please do it. So, um, Janet Collignan wanted to do a brief announcement. So, where is she? So, a little. Oh, no, sorry, before Janet. Um, yesterday in the bathroom, somebody found a camera. <coughs> is this. Does anybody recognize this camera? Left in the toilet? No? Okay, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it's not an improvised. <laughs> so some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm Janet Kaladner. I'm actually here um, as a uh, you know private researcher, but um, my roles as NSF program officer and uh, you know researchers are very much intertwined with each other. So I want to make an announcement, a couple of announcements, tell you about a couple of things going on there in NSF. Um, first of all, uh, I don't. I assume that you that all the Americans anyway know about the Cyber Learning Transforming Education Program. I, I know that I'm funding a bunch of you. We are funding a bunch of you through that. Um, we would love to fund a bunch more of you. And uh, there's no uh, solicitation out right now, but I did want to assure you that the solicitation will be out by the end of the summer. I don't know if the new solicitation will. I don't know if the dates will be exactly the same. I don't know if the categories will be exactly the same, but if you work towards the uh, ones that are there in the last solicitation, you, you, you won't go wrong. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Second thing is that the cyber learning program at NSF, um, it's about envisioning the next generation of learning technologies. It's about learning practical lessons about how to design and use them. Um, and it's about advancing the science of learning with technology. So it's about all of those things and the, um, the, the proposals that we, uh, that we uh, the projects we award from the program have all three of those components in them. But there's something else that the program is, uh, ha has a mission to do, and that is to um, help NSF bring together um, and somehow reach some sort of uh, coherence between its many programs that fund uh, learning technologies. So some of you have funding from the DRK-12 program, and some of you from RIS, and some of you from ISC, or its new name, AZEL, and TOOS, and it will be called CAUSE, and you know, all kinds of other programs. Um, so one of the things that we've done in order to, um, to make that coherence happen is to fund a uh, cyber learning resource center it's called CIRCLE, C-I-R-C-L, I don't remember what it stands for. Jeremy Rochelle at the um, at SRI is uh, running it, along with some people at EDC. We are having summits every other year. They will usually be in January, but the next one will be next year, this time in Boulder, uh, 
at the, uh, continues with the ICLS conference. Um, at, while we get back on track, we funded this thing like almost a year later than it was supposed to be funded, so everything got put off, but whatever. So I want you to be aware of that. Um, and uh, one of the things we've been talking about is what a shame it is that, the, that this community and the learning sciences community don't talk to each other more. I mean, I think that the, um, that the strengths of the two communities are uh, quite complementary. Um, and uh, I, I'm glad I had a chance to come here and find that out to actually for, you know, really to, to know it for sure now. Um, so one of the things I think that I, I'm going to take on as a challenge in my last year at NSF, I have one more year there, um, is to somehow figure out how to, how to make that happen better. And if some of you are interested in that, and you know, being involved in figuring out how to do that, let me know. Okay, I, I don't know what form it will take, and it will take more than a year to do it, but let me know if you want to be involved in that kind of planning. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, and this was what I, why I told them I wanted to come up here and talk, is that we have an, uh, a, 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 um, new, a kind of event called an Ideas Lab coming up. There's a solicitation out, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but something like Big Data in Education. Um, it came out through EHR, through the Education Directorate. Um, it's part of a national effort in Big Data. And, uh, some of you know that when you talk about big data in education, there are the people on your side of things and the learning sciences side of things that are working on this really tiny micro data that's coming from games or coming from, from, from uh, intelligent tutoring systems or something else where, the, you know, where you're collecting all that little data of people interacting with the machine. And they're the people who are working on like retention issues who are looking at what are the courses people have taken and, um, and you know, are they doing their homework? So can we be sure they're gonna stay at school? How can we help them graduate? And there's very, very little that's happening in the middle. So the idea here is that um, we wanna make the things that need to happen in the middle happen. Okay, all those things that can help people. I mean, some of you are talking about tracking your learning lifelong. I mean, that might fit into that. But the but the but the, the but this particular effort is um, primarily focused on school and uh, on helping on on the on on helping people make it through the formal system. Doesn't mean that what they're doing informally shouldn't be in, uh, included in that. It really it has to be included in that. You have to be taken into account what people are doing and learning outside of school if you're going to make school work work better. So uh, so we have the solicitation out. Um, and there will be what's called an Ideas Lab in October, October 7th to 11th. Ideas Lab is a week-long uh, convocation. I believe it will be in Atlanta, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so a week-long convocation in which um, uh, people from a variety of different um, uh, research communities will come together and figure out how they need to work together to, in fact, to address some of these uh, big challenges. Um, the really neat thing about the way the Ideas Lab is set up is that because it's a whole week long, the people who are there will actually be um, generating research projects while there. Um, it doesn't mean that people who are not there cannot be involved in those projects, um, but the people who are there will be putting projects together with other people who are there. Okay, um, the, the two-page pre-proposals in order to get yourself invited to that are due sometime soon. So I want to invite the EDM folks who are here, I want to invite the people you know, who are interested in the real learning data analytics. I didn't say learning analytics and I didn't say data mining. Okay, who are really interested in, um, in, in helping us understand how to, how to keep track of what people know, what they're learning, what they need to know, um, you know moving them towards success, um, to put in your two pages and, and be at that. Um, there, if you read the solicitation, you'll also see you can put in proposals even if you're not at the event. But I, I just, I really, really want to invite people, urge you to apply to come to the event.
Okay, so uh, now on to our keynote speaker. Um, so um, we've had um, uh, three keynote speakers uh, at this conference, and uh, Chad and I wanted to uh, make sure that we had uh, keynote speakers that were, well, at least two of them that were reaching out, that were not traditionally in our community, and we wanted to reach out to communities, uh, research communities that are. Um, very interested in, on the same, in the same topics as AI, but who don't necessarily uh, come to uh, the conferences and um, who uh, come from um, different backgrounds. So we've had Maria Russo yesterday and today uh, Doug uh, Clark from, uh, who's coming more from a learning science um, background. And um, so I'm going to introduce him now. And He's, um, so Doug is an associate professor at the Peabody College um, of Education and Human Development at uh, Vanderbilt University. His research uh, is in students' learning processes in technology-enhanced or game learning environment, and he particularly focuses on understanding uh, students' conceptual change processes, collaboration, argumentation, and use of representation in these environments. So, uh, a strong focus of his research is um, in, um, in, in supporting um, science learning and um, through the, the, the use of digital learning environments and game-like environments. So his study work has been funded by uh, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Education, um, and the National Academic, uh, Academy of Education, Spencer Foundation. So he's a PI on uh, a, the, the project, well, on a, 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 a program called SURGE, which stands for Scaffolding and Standing by Redesigning Games for Education. Um, and uh, through these uh, projects and the day, he explores with his team the integration of game playing dynamics with uh, research for learning, from, from, from learning sciences, psychology, uh, science education, and computer science to support learners in developing robust understanding of core scientific uh, concepts and processes. So um, the work that he will describe today in his talk um, is um, how to uh, go beyond the, the, the shallow level of fun in game playing and really designing uh, tool, uh, games and learning environments, digital learning environments that uh, get to a deeper view of, um, uh, on motivation and learning. Um, so, um, it's my pleasure to uh, thank Doug today for uh, making the effort to come to EIA 2014 and I will let him now present the work, the exciting work that he and his colleagues are doing. Thank you very much. So, I knew I wanted EPIC. This is Friday morning, two conferences down, banquet the night before, couldn't be small. Art had suggested that he was going to dress up as Elvis, <laughs> and I was going to dress up as Johnny Cash, and that sounded a little more than I could manage. Apparently, though, with all this song and dance this week, I <clears throat> might not have been as, as challenging as I might have thought. <laughs> and in fact, if people are looking sleepy, we may break out in song later this morning. But, so I knew I wanted epic, so I started sort of classic epic. You know, beyond good and evil, but it didn't sound very lively. And so I started thinking, well, is, is it epic in the sense of not evil? Yeah. Or not ugly? And I kept thinking, it's like, well, you know, we've made things that weren't pretty. But that wasn't what I was really looking for. What I realized what I cared about was uh, moving beyond overly simplistic. Epic in the sense of not overly simplistic. Um, complexity and precision and the kind of research we need to be doing to move games research forward. So I moved away from the black background briefly and decided, well, what are the overly simplistic things I want to try and address that I see a lot in research that we do and that I see in our field? Um, and so I call it beyond good, bad, and fun. Because those are three very simplistic terms that we hear a lot. And Kalina had mentioned a little bit about the fun part, but I've also added good and bad. As long as we're, getting, we're dealing with simplistic. And before I go further, I really want to acknowledge, well, the whole search team, and I'll show a slide later with the whole search team, but in particular, Emily Tanner-Smith, 
Stephen Killingsworth and Mario Mar Martinez Garza, whose work is heavily represented in, in this talk. And part one actually is about the good and the bad. And it's about thinking meta-analytically about design over medium. A lot of the debate that we've heard about games and learning to date has been, are games good, are games bad, or are they better, are they worse? And to some degree, those are fine questions with which to begin, but you eventually need to move beyond those. Um, and a lot of it's even been evangelical. So we undertook with funding from the Gates Foundation a meta-analysis of the research on games for learning to really try and add another stone on which to step so that we can move beyond with this good versus bad. So that's where I'm going to start, and later on we're going to move on to the beyond fun uh, issue. So there have been three meta-analyses, really, that have focused on games to date, but they've been in some ways tangential. Um, Vogel and Vogel et al. Uh, focused on games and simulations, obviously blending two very large areas. And they looked at very few studies, relatively speaking, on the order of um, 20 to 30-ish. Sitzman then, in 2011, published something on simulate what he called simulation games, but he was really focusing on training adults for the workforce. And specifically said, I don't want to talk. He didn't want to, he wanted to distinguish from talking about games for learning for um, children. And then, most recently, but we didn't know about this one when we were getting started, it just came out this spring, Wooters et al. in Utrecht um, did a, published a um, meta-analysis on serious games in um, educational psychologist, I guess, or no, review, but I can't remember the exact journal. But um, they, and that was the closest to what we're doing. But in there, just like the first two, they focused on me, what Rich Mayer calls media comparison studies, which is where the field's been. A lot of people have wanted that. Media comparison is, is this medium better than that medium? And, and in our field, Sigmund Tobias and others have been calling for, well, art. They, we want these studies. So I'm not saying that these studies are bad. It's just the first step. It's the good versus bad. Or, um, and so Wooters et al. said, well, we also need to move to what Rich Mayer is calling value-added studies. Like, what is the, and basically, what is the role of design within a medium? Right? Basically, value-added is we have a base version of, the, in our case, a game, and then we, we enhance it in some way hopefully based from a theoretical perspective, is that going to make a difference and what kind of difference, what things matter. So, and luckily for us, since we didn't know that Wooters was gonna call for this, we already thought this was important, so we, this is something that we did. Um, in terms of the contributions, we survey a broader scope of the literature, we apply newly developed statistical techniques, we have some experts at Vanderbilt who in that analysis, um, and we verify and extend the three prior meta-analyses in terms of media comparison, and we also move beyond media comparison to value-added studies. And then we conduct also are conducting a systematic analysis of research quality issues within it. Um, we ended up identifying over 62,000 um, articles across multiple databases, across multiple fields, um, they, they peer-reviewed journals, um, experimental or quasi-experimental design, we didn't want to miss anything, so we were looking for just game or games in the abstract or title at the first level, and then we, were, we screened from there. Um, we covered multiple fields because games research happens across multiple fields. Um, but though there were, we started with a very large number of articles, ultimately only 86 reports or um, articles um, met all the criteria, and of which that was based on 79 data samples or studies. So, but again, that's roughly twice as many had been identified in the others, so it was a step forward. Uh, we based it on the Interseas report on um, 21st century skills by Pellegrino and um, colleagues. And that, that broke down learning into three large categories, cognitive, intrapersonal, intrapersonal. But um, turns out most everything was in the cognitive. Um, and almost nothing was in the interpersonal. It's, but it's pretty, 
I, but, it, but again, it may be a function of the kinds of methods that we were screening for. Pre post tests of interpersonal skills, we don't really have good measures for it, so it's not surprising that we don't have many studies, and that's a theme we'll come back to later. Um, well spread across location, this is an international conference. Um, the studies were spread across um, continents and across outcome disciplines. So it wasn't just science education. Um, a, lot, um, a lot of different um, areas of learning were uh, focused. Now before I go forward, I wanted to explain something about meta-analyses and determining, for a lot of us, it's just as P less than 0.05. Um, and for meta-analyses, like, there's a different way of determining um, significance for reading it. Essentially, there's, you report a confidence interval. And just so long as zero is not within the bounds of the confidence interval, that result is considered significant. So when you're reading a table, so that would be significant. This would not be, no matter what the effect size is. It's um, not just worthwhile, but it's going to show you tables. Um, and first, the forest. And I'm not even going to talk a lot about the forest, other than to say that there were, we, we broke, but at the forest level, we saw very similar patterns in terms of cognitive and intrapersonal outcomes. And so going forward, I'm just going to talk about the all learning outcomes rolled together because most everything was cognitive to begin with. Um, and across all of it, and this is something that this group would be shocked by, but is worthwhile for politicians, there was no evidence of significant adverse outcomes. Um, yes! <laughs> So, again, the purpose, the reason Gates funded this is they really wanted to have a benchmark against which to move some of their efforts forward. And it sounded like an interesting opportunity to me um, to, get, to move beyond the rhetoric of good, bad. Um, so now let's look at uh, one of the tables. This is the media comparisons. Um, so a digital gain in one condition versus some non-gain comparison, typically traditional instruction. Um, or something akin to that. A, um, it, you know, here are a set of problems on paper, answer it, and here are some answers. Um, here's, here's a media uh, PowerPoint presentation to watch. Um, and then this G column, that's the um, standard deviation associated. Um, this is the confidence interval. This is the number of effect sizes or pairwise comparisons and the number of studies. As I said, we're using new meta-analytic techniques that allow you to combine mul multiple uh, effect sizes or pairwise comparisons from an, a single study. Um, and it waits for that. And um, essentially, the bottom line is digital games can outperform traditional or typical designs for learning in non-game media. So that doesn't mean, again, moving past simplistic, that you couldn't design something in these other media that would be just as good or better. It means compared to what is normally done. This is something that's also overlooked. I was horrified. Uh, Forbes, Forbes.com quoted our study recently, along with something about SRI, and it said, study shows that games lead to a 12% increase for median students compared to, compared to, compared, compared to the construction. And so that was a real condensation and slightly, slight distortion of what we had said. But I'll also come to this point later. A person with whom I worked, Geneva Hartel at SRI, had talked to Bob Mislevy and asked for advice about these meta-analyses that we were doing. And Bob had said, among other things, read the entire report very carefully and make sure that there's not a single sentence that you wouldn't mind appearing all by itself, completely out of context, on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> and so I was, I mean, I, this is not, I don't do meta analyses normally. And so this was, that Forbes.com article was a real wake-up call to me. And that was, that came out based on the preliminary report, where we weren't even thinking, this is final, here's just what we were going to show Gates, here's where we are now, we need to continue the analyses, and then here it is on Forbes.com. Um, and so, terrified. So, Anyway, what we do see across all of this is that games overall, there's about a third of the standard deviation um, over standard traditional instruction. Um, it, in ours, it doesn't seem to matter whether it's blended with normal instruction or not. 
So for instance, is there, um, is it just the game versus some comparison condition, or is it a game plus additional construction instruction versus either a, a, another comparison condition with that additional instruction or just lots of extra additional instruction? Um, and this is different from what Wooters found, and we're, we're looking at it, but it's more similar to what uh, Sitzman found. Game type, and I'm gonna come back to this, we had originally dreamed of looking at all these very specific things. Does extra scaffolding work? Does social, do social supports make a difference? And that gets really irresponsible and dangerous, it turns out, because it's an apples and apples kind of thing. I'm going to talk more about that, too. But at the most basic level, we looked at games that were just about adding points and badges um, versus more advanced designs. And it's pretty, we saw pretty similar effects across them. And then another area we tried to look at is the variety of game actions that a player engaged in. Like type, like in Tetris, you do a couple things over and over again. Um, in other games, you do a lot of different kinds of things. And here's here's an effect that I want to come back to and talk and look at. The one place we saw less difference were in these um, large variety of action games. And I'm going to just as a, as a foreshadowing, I think that actually has more to do with assessment alignment than it has to do with the games themselves. And so this is some this is a good takeaway message that I'm going to come back to. Similarly, with discipline, some, some studies have come out saying, well, it doesn't look like it, it works for math, but not for science. And so if you think about why in the world that might be, um, or literacy, you know, it's all these different things. Again, it comes down to the, the kinds of assessment that are being done and the kinds of things that are being measured. And so again, we backed way off of that, and we're going to talk more about that later. Um, but what was so anyway? So what we showed with the first one, what's useful is we laid that stone in the foundation, saying, yes, indeed, it appears that games can, um, as a medium, can support learning that at least is as good at, if not better than, normal instruction in this other media. And that seems simple, but it's what the field needs. So we did that. What's interesting that we've not done yet, which again is going to just stand a reason to all of us, because we're all tinkerers and designers and we care about design, is that design matters. And we need that piece of information to move, the um, again, the debate forward. But here in these value-added comparisons, we see that compared to, the, to base games, there's again about a third of a standard deviation based on design. And I, I, there's not a person here who doesn't think that's true, but that's a number that policymakers need to see and we need to move, even the, at, the, at the NRC's report on games and simulations, it's are they good, are they bad? And this really actually follows an, another earlier NRC report on labs in science. It's called America's Lab Report, 2005 National Research Council, which said, you know, are labs good to have in schools? And it's like, well, it's actually a function of design. And you wouldn't think it would take a whole NRC report to prove that, but it did. And so here's for games, and it's actually a meta-analysis to do it. So, um, so what's more important to think about, these value-added comparisons provide empirical proof that the real questions for future research focus on design. So we can move on to design now and stop doing these, comparing to the <coughs> traditional instruction, instead compare. Um, and the simple point's been missing. And so which research and game features moderate outcomes is something we really wanted to look at in this meta-analysis, but it turns out it's challenging talked about this. To move along, I also thought I was going to have an hour and 15 minutes, not 15 minutes, so I'm going to skip some slides. Um, we, we looked across a lot of different study quality mo moderators, and at the simple level of good versus bad, they don't affect the outcomes particularly. <coughs> but they are going to affect the ability to do something, well, I know, I'll come back to it, to do some other things that we care about. Here we go. Take home. That analyses assume that you're comparing apples to apples. Um, and at, at the level of media comparison, that's not so hard. It's game or not game. But if you want to go any further than that, you need to start um, specifying and categorizing with much greater complexity and precision. Um, and that wasn't really available in, in, in the studies we were reviewing to date. And I'll talk about why that is. It's in, well, the short version is 
almost every study either provides elaborate and lavish detail about the methods they used the, the, in, in the analyses, or they provide elaborate and lavish de detail about what the conditions were. Almost no studies provide both. Look in, look in your journals, it's a part of it's a function of fields. Open up a psychology journal, generally speaking, you're going to have incredible focus on um, the methods that were used. But um, in fact, for our back on the quality, to say it was quality, sufficient reporting of a condition we were talking about includes 500 words or more was considered good. Um, including a screenshot was considered good. That's good. A lot of this, a lot of articles don't even provide that. They will spend 30% of their um, uh, content on describing the, the, the statistical methods and the statistical analyses, but will not provide a single screenshot and more, more than a sentence about we use the game in one condition. So again, that might be enough for a media comparison, but it's really not enough to support comparison of features and get into the design. But on the other side, if you go into the games literature, like I, I, I straddle both worlds, and I'm guilty of all of these things on both sides. So I'm not pointing fingers. In fact, at the very end, if we have time, I want to talk about what does this all mean for us and what, what we do. Um, we can provide lavish detail and theoretical foundations for, all, for the interventions we're trying. But if we don't provide the information about the, uh, the, the methods that we're using to analyze, um, or the reliability of our assessments, I think a real, real problem in my field we, there aren't standardized normed assessments for all for the different conceptual things we want to measure. So we tend to make up our own assessments. And since we tend to make up our own assessments and have a lot of other things to do, we don't tend to even do things as simple as provide like co Cohen's reliability coefficients and stuff like that. It would at least be at the minimum necessary for you to decide the quality of our instruments. So I'm saying I've done both. But that's what you see across all these fields. Um, And then, so it's easy to take the comparisons out of context when you don't have that information. And so, it's not even really an apples to apples. And you think, in medicine, they talk about, you think, that would be the easy place to do meta-analyses. Um, it's like, you know, 40 milligrams of this three times a week for four weeks. Uh, and in fact, there are articles in there saying how hard it is. And depending on which factors you use to decide to include a study or not, you get entirely different um, Outcomes. And in a paper, I've got a citation to a, a wonderful study that makes just that point. So for us, in, a social, in a, a social endeavor, obviously it's even more complex. So in terms of all studies, I'm, I'm dividing this slide into two, two categories. There's the, the, the parameters to which all studies should be held, and then there's some that depend on the study. Um, all studies should be held to sufficient condition reporting, sufficient um, comparison condition quality comparisons, getting away from straw men comparisons, which are, are very common, um, adequate reporting of methods and analysis, and adequate justification of the alignment of the assessments. Um, that seems simple and obvious, but it doesn't happen um, very regularly. Now, bottom two or two, that depend on the context and involve trade-offs. In terms of research design, it's arguable that an experimental design is more rigorous. The problem is that it can also in make something completely inauthentic and, and, and not allow entire areas of research and things you want to study. So there are trade-offs there, and it's more just you have to justify the choice you're making, and you also have to if you choose a quasi, uh, a quasi experimental design, to go out of your way to, to provide data so that people can decide how equivalent the conditions are. Um, and that's obvious to everybody here, but it's worth saying. And then assessment types. Gates really wanted us to say everyone ought to be using normed assessments, norm standardized assessments. I think before they, before they came in, now they've seen this, I think they, they understood the point is made. The problem is, that limits you to a very narrow band of things you might be studying. Um, 
And for, in particular, coming back to this idea of the games that have a larger variety of actions, and which generally are tied to higher level thinking, like inquiry, problem solving, creativity. There aren't a lot of standardized normed assessments for that. So we can't just say everyone needs to use the norm standard test. But if you're going to make your own assessment, there's a lot of additional information you really need to provide. And we also it also suggests that there needs to be a lot more collaboration to develop approaches to assessment. Um, for instance, well, we'll move on. I don't want to take too much time. But, so final thoughts. There's Bob Mislevy. I told you about that story. And this I saw this. This is just how I felt when I saw the Forbes article. Um, so I've talked about that. I've talked about design features and apples and oranges and other apples. Disciplinary context we touched on. These were just things I wanted to make sure I, did, I touched on. Um, assessment alignment. This is the tricky one worth talking about. Sometimes there's really over alignment. And then people can say, well, the assessment isn't really any different than the task you're having to do. And that might or might not be bad. But it's certainly not worse than under alignment or um, just measuring what, you're, what you want entirely. I, I joke with my students, if you want something really reliable, you could have the students go out, um, in terms of like science understanding, out to the uh, basketball um, that stand at the free throw line and shoot 10 baskets. And we will be able to measure with great reliability how many baskets they are able to shoot. We won't know a whole lot about what they actually know about science, but we can tertiarily argue, well, it's something about physics. <laughs> um, so again, with uh, the assessments we're building, we really need to be more, and the not wonderful thing here, we have a lot of really sophisticated um, assessment people. In fact, um, Val, Val is a pioneer. Jan Scobert just started a, a company, actually, to do formative assessments. Um, so we have the people here, and we need to think about how are we going to measure the things we care about. And it's not just for this problem, but right now with the Common Core and Next Generation Science Standards, although they're calling for 21st century kinds of skills and scientific practices, until we can measure them and assess them, nothing is going to change. And so if we can develop these assessments um, in this group more than any other group could possibly do it, it can also change what's happening in the field, so it, it's, it's important. Um, and then last, range of methodologies. This is a meta-analysis, so it's focusing on experimental and quasi-experimental methods. I do a lot of other kind of work too, and I'm certainly not saying that those are the only two methods that are worth pursuing. There are other quantitative methods, modeling methods, HLM, SEM, there are a lot of qualitative methods. We need all of those. I'm talking about these methods just because this is a meta-analysis and that's, that's what's involved in this methodology. So that is about getting beyond good and bad. Now fun, um, people, and again, it's a very shallow debate in our, in our field about games. Why should we use games? Why, why are games good? Um, why do games get people to learn stuff? And pretty generally, particularly from people who don't play games, but also from people who do play games here, well, games are fun. Games are engaging because they're fun. Um, and that's not helpful. Again, coming back to being overly simplistic, um, we need theoretical precision if we're going to move forward. So, and here are two people that have talked a lot about that. Um, this is Paul Pintrich, and he made very clear that motivation to learn in the classroom goes well beyond fun. And here's Jim G, and he's argued for a long time that engagement in games goes well beyond fun. And what I want to talk about today is using research on motivation to learn that um, Paul Pintrich consolidated across the literature that was conducted by many, many people, is provides a powerful lens for theoretically operationalizing engagement to learn and persistent serious games. Just as a way of showing, as an example, of an area where we tend to talk about some things at a very shallow level, but there's a whole theoretical base we could be drawing on. And I think this is true in a number of other areas, too, of, of research. And again, to, to thank people, this is work that I've been doing with Mario Martinez Garza and Stephen and um, Dan Adams. Um, so he, in um, 2003, synthesized across the literature on motivation to learn 
but with a particular focus on classrooms, five overall sort of constructs of, of robustly supported findings that I think are useful just as touchstones to point out like what we're talking about games as being fun and how we might be thinking about them in terms of that literature. One is that adaptive self-efficacy and confidence beliefs motivate students. In other words, if a student um, feels that they can be successful, that motivates students, and there's huge literature about that. Another is that adaptive attributions and control beliefs motivate students. In other words, to what degree the students feel in control of their outcomes. Uh, again, huge, huge um, set, um, a base of research that we can be drawing on. Higher levels of interest and intrinsic motivation motivate students, again. And higher levels of value and goals. Now, now he, when he, when he, these are his, these are direct quotes. This is, this is a very smart man, very respected in his field. And he boiled it down, the, the, the literature in these five very accessible constructs, and then he provides links in the literature for each of those areas that even if you're not aware of that literature at all, you can read this article, look at these, find, find this section, and start finding the people you ought to be reading. Um, and, move, and stop saying, well, games are, games are engaging because they're fun. It's like, well, then we can move beyond. And just so, his synthesis focus on classrooms, um, and here are just some examples. So this idea that if, if, you, if you have confidence and, you, and a sense of self-efficacy, it will motivate students. And so what could that describe in games? How, what could we be using to break down? We talk about narrative and pra narrative <laughs> practice a lot in games. This idea that games develop this sense of um, that over time you will um, practice and improve and you will eventually succeed. So we could be using, I mean, there's a whole body of research for there. Difficulty curves, this idea that the, uh, difficulty curves in games. Boss encounters. Um, all of these are things that we can be digging into with that whole first construct. In terms of adaptive attributions and control beliefs, again, narrative practice. Um, this dynamic control. I mean, Mickey Chi taught, has done, it's done a whole recent series of studies on active and interactive and passive. Um, a lot of people talk about you know, and their control conditions, passive versus active. Um, and the games, obviously, we talk about, well, they're, it's because they're interactive. So, there, there's, a, there's an important place to touch. Customization, um, in terms of control. This is all stuff from a game I play. That's my character. Um, uh, intrinsic motivation and interest. Um, novelty and emergent experiences can be discussed that way. Many games, <laughs> meaningful play. And value. Now this is a place where games have tended to they tend to focus most often, the commercial ones are the, the highest frequency on um, destruction. And I like the destructive games. I play Mech Warrior Online a lot, lot, lot right now. 100 foot big metal robots, blowing up other big metal robots. Free to play, great game. But um, in terms of engendering valuable um, values that are um, important to society, those games aren't have done as well. But there are games like Fold It. Um, Saturna, um, and epistemic games, which, which we can start looking at value and how the value of society, the value the student places on it, and using that literature to think about value as motivation. And then goals, and particularly he talks a lot about social goals as motivating. And so people talk about the, the social goals in MMORPGs and the affinity spaces around games. So all of these are things that are important in our field that could be talked about much more um, with greater theoretical precision, with a huge extant body of literature, and, it, and Pintridge's article provides a great gateway. Uh, and obviously there are um, uh, so many um, very distinguished psychologists in this community right now that you can use to talk to them. But a lot of the talks that I've gone and seen here have stated, have often not delved very deep into the theoretical basis of what's underlying the um, interactions that are there. Now, it's not just this community. I, I just came from Games Learning and Society, and it was even less, less prevalent there. So, but it's, it, this is a place where we can be digging. To, to, and once we have, um, it's the whole game we're playing, supposedly. Our work is supposed to build on a theoretical basis and foundation and extend it. If we just say, I built it and it works, it's not that helpful to other people. It's more just an existence proof. And I do that, I do this too.
So don't worry, come back to it. And then the last thing that's worth looking at, and why it's worth looking at, at this, games for learning tend to um, focus on commercial game design principles for inspiration. And as a result, um, commercial games don't tend, aren't usually able to count on there being teachers and coaches available. And so teachers and coaches tend to be not involved in commercial game design principles. And so they tend not to show up in a lot of serious game design principles. But if we think about, these are four, four of the design principles that Pendridge lays out based on his con across the constructs. That's a place where we should be thinking. So by looking on this theoretical base, we can be thinking about areas we're missing. Um, so take home is just, Research on games for learning can't move forward without strong theoretical foundations. And this body of research is one that really lends itself well. And it's, it's, it's critical to the field, because the field is based heavily on this idea of why games are engaging. Now, implications for our group. As I said, this is all, all this is, do we need to break into song? Mission and all. <laughs> um, here's the slide from a workshop, the workshop on Tuesday. This is the surge team. So it's a lot of people, and this, we're working on um, a number of things. A thing that I've been focused on from our, the first surge grant in 2008 um, is this idea of Vygotsky's spontaneous and scientific concepts and how they can bootstrap one another from um, thought and language. <coughs> And just that there's, going back to the basketball thing I was talking about, there's a kind of physics that's intuitive that people might understand, and that there's this other more formal kind of physics, and how might they bootstrap one another? And Vygotsky talks about them as how they, how they can, and so a lot of our work in games was focused on that. Games are re classrooms focus on formal understanding, and are horrible at intuitive understanding in science, usually. Um, games focus on intuitive understanding, but yeah, it's not part of their... Um, their, their mandate to develop formal understanding. And so it's generally that there's enough of intuitive understanding to succeed in the game, and that's where it stops. So how do you connect the two? And we do a number of things. Um, Galvin, who works with us, does, it really helps us out with the data mining. And I don't know if John Kennedy was here, this is something he's, he worked on. We also do things in terms of modeling and social engineering. But what I talked about on um, Tuesday was scaffolding explanation through dialogue, and it's a great example of both the beyond good and bad and the beyond fun, and where we where we fail or where we can do better. Um, so in our game, this particular game, it's a physics game, and people uh, is based on this idea of prediction and explanation. Um, first, the players need to make the prediction by drawing a flight flight plan where they're going to go. But it's not just pull out your notebook and write down your prediction, pull out your notebook, how did how your prediction differ. We try to build it into the interface. So you, 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 you're, you, you lay out a drawn trajectory of where you want to go, then you create a, create a plan for how you're going to do it, and then you launch it. And what we wanted was to try and um, build in self-explanation. And so when you left that line, it was supposed to pop out and say, what in the world happened? And then uh, and help you scaffold you through. And so the first the first thing we did, I'm, I'm going to show you, was rudimentary, and it failed miserably because we ignored all the things I've told you so far today. <laughs> um, at least the pilot did. Um, and then it it'll say it it's, it, 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 it it tries to guess at what, what why you diverge from that line and provide you with quite, uh, some questions around that and. Um, we had 86 8th grade students um, earlier this um, spring, and essentially they were signed either to getting nothing, this didn't happen to them at all, you got tips, or you got questions. Um, and pretty much um, the questions was the worst. Certainly not the best. It wasn't, uh, they weren't significantly different, but it was, certainly wasn't significantly better. And we were sad. And what we really saw but this is, we didn't need to run the numbers to see this. The approach was far too intrusive. The feedback and explanations were too loosely fitted into the situation. The players were penalized for experimentation because every time they experimented, up came this question again. And you can, Matt yesterday is studying some stuff. I've seen him here, right there. 
um, about you know uh, penalties in commercial games versus penalties in learning games. And the students in the base condition actually made it further in the game because they were being held up. So what does this mean and what should we do? And this is the full circle part, taking our own advice. One is we really need to analyze the design for engagement more theoretically. What we did was fun. It wasn't engaging. And if you looked at all those principles, it would have been pretty clear where we were going awry. And again, some of this I'm saying we sort of we didn't think what we were doing was perfect, but it's also the balance that all of you know about of um, production and wanting to get something out to try something versus polish. Um, and we also we need to be take, we also have worked through with in terms of integrating the data mining more carefully. And so we've been, and we've been already, because we knew this was probably the case, just this week we've got a redesigned inter, well, interface to allow it to not, rather than happen at the same time, it's more going to happen after someone has succeeded at something and after they've been scaffolded. So here I'm just going to, this is a, a flash file that we, this our stuff's written in flash. And it's just an automated that runs through the functionality. I just got this yesterday. So here they are. Um, they get to play, play as simple level as often as they want. And it's keeping track of how long it takes and what problems they're having. And then afterward, they say, oh my gosh, um, we've been watching you. What in the world? Um, how did you do it? We want to do it too. And so here are the little fuzzy creatures that um, you're working with. Here's you. And it's keeping track of you. And eventually, you're going to be scaffolded. Everybody gets to the end of this. Everyone first gets a chance to succeed at the level. And then they get to go through all the, all the dialogue. And it's after it, so it's not interrupting their level. And it's keeping track of their progress. And okay, actually, we can go back now. And then their progress is reflected. There's someone who's about, um, oh, I can't remember the title. It was yesterday afternoon, last session, about punishment, rewards being punishing, and extrinsic motivation. Yeah, and so it's the same kind of thing. We're trying to build the rewards more intrinsically into the fabric of the game. And so your relationships with these people improve. Levels are unlocking. Your rank's advancing. You're getting new cool stuff. Um, so it's not just. Um, you got points. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are a lot of things that we've known we wanted to do for more than a year now, and it's just there's always this delay between planning and production. But so the first thing we were able to get out failed dramatically, but we wanted to try it anyway. But it could have been predicted just if we'd been looking at the literature I've been talking about. Um, but now completely full circle back to the first half. And this is the problem we came up to uh, against when we were trying to um, decide in our meta-analysis about which features um, were effective. If I were to publish two studies, or just after the first study, our pilot study, and we were to look at that, it's like, oh, self-explanation fails in games. You know, no positive effect. Um, there would be no reason to go forward, because that would be right back to you. Um, and even if we did the second game, the second version, or let's, let's, even, let's say this next one we're going to do, do is, is, is more successful, just for, just for the sake of argument. So now there are two studies out there. One shows, the first one shows there is no effect. The second one shows there is an effect. And if I'm just saying I'm comparing studies that are about um, self-explanation, I'm going to say it's very unclear, because I'm going to lump those two together. And I don't think they're the same thing. And certainly, if I don't provide enough information in my about the conditions I'm comparing, no one's going to be able to make that distinction for themselves. So it comes back to my whole other point about what we need to do a better job of in terms of specification. So this comes back to, and um, I really want to underline this idea of assessments. Where we're really in trouble right now, particularly in science education, is we care, we care dramatically for 100 years about practices and process skills, if you read George DeBoer's History of Science Education. 
Um, but now, in the latest standards, we're saying it even more loudly. We're saying it, number one, this is what we care about. But the assessments aren't measuring that. And if they're not measuring that, A, we're not going to know if we're doing, you know, it makes no difference um, what we do. Um, and there's not going to be an interest in doing what we do. And Val and, well, I don't know if we have anybody else who's involved in, in the Glass Lab right now. They're really working on developing with EA games that focus on these high-level skills. But without great assessments, um, it's all going to be for naught. And same with the new standards. Um, so anyway, it's 10 after, and I, told, I promised I'd end at 10, and it's 10, 10 after. And so beyond good, bad, and fun, moving games research forward, um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we can have a good song. <laughs> Performance. Yeah. <laughs> so the, Interpretive the, dances. The, the singing performance. Yeah. Uh, well, we have the band right here. <laughs> I think we have, we've got a couple more minutes for them to come on out. <laughs> okay, so the microphone won't work while you have that. I so, can turn this off. Um, well, I don't know whether... Then they can use that. Or people can just ask their... Yeah. Right? That won't work while that I have works. this. Yeah, that works. That works. Because okay. works. I just turned this so, one off. Okay, so we've got uh, time for two questions. Uh, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, it's lots of house, but, but one is that um, you're calling for sort of a more theoretically founded um, approach to designing games, and you're proposing that we should, that the foundation should be found in the literature of motivation, which indeed is <coughs> very rich, but, but in, in my as I've looked at it, literature, um, although an uh, incredible amount is known about what motivates students, it, it often, that literature often doesn't get you to the point of that it actually helps you in design because uh, the recommendations are often not very specific. So, so another uh, view on your idea might be that we can actually use games to um, flesh out that literature in a way that it, that brings us closer to the to the things we to the details we need to think about as we're actually designing. I agree 100%. Uh, a different version <coughs> of this talk might have been what can we learn about motivation from games? You know, in terms of the, the different principles. I also think we'll take a step back further. We it also can inform how we think not just about the design of games, but the design of um, other instruction and traditional instruction in schools. We've had this literature on motivation to learn that's focused on classrooms for a long time. But if we walk into a classroom, we don't see a lot of those kinds of things happening. And if nothing else, we can look in these other um, contexts, like games, to see um, how some of these ideas are actually being leveraged. So there are these simple ideas that have been tested and been tested, but what it might look like is less clear, and games provide um, possible um, templates for how one might go about developing a sense of confidence and self-efficacy, for instance, or um, how we might be balancing intrinsic and extrinsic rewards, um, which is what, getting, what was talked about yesterday. So thank you, yeah, absolutely, Vincent. Who want to ask questions? Go and sit in the same corner there. <laughs> so, uh, Hagar, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, I, I would like you to give us three very short examples, right, of some things that you've designed and how you used some of that literature in order to do it. So, get real concrete for us. Well, I want to step back. That particular body of literature was just one exemplar of a body of literature on which we might draw. First, I'd like to talk about um, the literature on self-explanation and how we've been thinking about that. Um, and then also in the science education world, 
there's a somewhat related body of research um, called Predict, Observe, Explain, um, which follows on a lot of the same ideas. And you could start with that literature, particularly the Predict, Observe, Explain literature, and it would suggest that if you were going to engage students in physics learning, that um, in a classroom, the traditional approach is you have them pull out their journal, they write down their prediction, they go do their thing, then they come back to their journal, they say, how is what happened different? That's the explained part. Um, and to take that wholesale directly into the design of a game would be disastrous. And that's pretty much what happened in the example um, I showed today. It, was, it took the person out of the game, it was not part of the game, and it destroyed the game. So it was essentially, if you just take that, that literature and how it's um, been adapted historically and just tack it on, um, that you're, it, there's going to be failure. So what we tried to do in terms of the prediction uh, was to think, well, what would, it, what it would the prediction look like in the context of a game where it would be part of the game? And that's where we came up with the, the, the flight plan where people are drawing their flight plan and they're doing it to convince their 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 crew of you know so the crew can prepare and the crew is ready and the crew um, has a sense of what what to try and do and then it and then in terms of the self explanation what we wanted this is what we thought would be great rather than stop and go right to some third person because in the game everything has to have has to there has to be a feedback loop. And if you go off to the journal that's outside of the game, there's not going to be that feedback loop. So we thought, well, how about then if the crew gets restless and says, we're not going further. If we can't stay on, stay on, on, stay on target, how are we going to stay on target? Or in this case of what we're doing now, um, to provide a reason within the game that you might want to explain. Not just because you're being forced to, but that you might want to. This is this idea of a lot of the literature it's been written both on girls and boys and what people, the, the, the context of people like. Turns out, people really resonate with rescue metaphors in games. And so what we thought was, after Surge had successfully um, rescued some of these fuzzies, creatures, the, then when it comes in, the other fuzzies are saying, wow, thanks for saving our friends. We really want to do that too, but we're stuck. You know, how do we do this? To sort of create a context within the game where this explanation is more natural. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we're going, and we'll tell you how that is what we wanted to do for a long time, but building the, building the technology to do it has been a little more difficult, but that's what we'll be trying out this fall. So I guess that's prediction, explanation, and to some degree, um, goals and motivation, how we're trying to tap into those things. So, can I pass it to somebody else besides you, Vincent? I'll take one. Okay. And it's also, it's, it's 10.15, so I, I, this is maybe the last question, I think. Okay, well, chair. Oh, chair. Okay, well, I was told. I was told 10.15, so why don't we do one more? Okay, just one last one. So first of all, um, I commend you for uh, airing your dirty laundry, if you will, for uh, presenting a, uh, a game that failed, explaining why. And I've got my own dirty laundry. I think we all do have been involved in this. And as you're talking and reflecting, well, so what are, how do we get into this problem? I think a lot of this is how this problem of having good intentions and yet producing a game which doesn't uh, hit the mark. And I think this just follows up on what, what Vincent was, was saying, is often we're guided by the literature at sort of broad concepts that aren't really specific enough to, to provide good design guidance. Yep. And a couple of examples uh, being a matter of, of extrinsic motivators such as badges, we know that can be good, can be bad. Well, what, what are the good ones? How to define them? And another one is narrative. You know, generally narrative arc is good, but some narrative arcs can actually promote learning, and some can actually um, sort of not give you enough opportunity to perform time on task because you can't replay. So I guess what I'm 
proposing, I wonder if you agree, is really as a, as a, as a community, we need to come up with a better, more precise set of terms for the design concepts we're appealing, which are grounded, which we can relate back to the motivational literature, but have a clearer definition so that we can then actually um, compare and contrast and understand how to make progress. That would be absolutely fabulous. And it would come back to also the meta-analysis problem of what things are apples and what, what kind of apples. Um, so I agree. Entirely. And then another thing that you were talking about in terms of grounding it in specific literature is what Vincent was talking about. I held up the motivation to learn literature is just one literature. The, the literature on cognitive load um, is obviously highly relevant. Self explanation in our case is highly relevant. Um, it, um, worked examples. I mean, the list, there is so much literature on which we can draw. And I just chose one that was seemed particularly salient to, a, to a, um, an oversimplification of the games research. Games are motivating because they're fun. Um, but it applies across. The question would be, how can the world, can we get everyone to agree to use the terms? Um, and even within this one field, within the, the say we could even get AIED to um, put together a working group and create our document of definitions. Um, in games research, it happens not just in the social sciences, it's in the natural sciences, it's in medicine. That's where our search was. We looked across all the, so the, I don't know who's got the clout mm -hmm. to say this, these are the definitions we can use. Maybe Rich Mayer does. I hope so. <laughs> we should talk to him. The multimedia principles extended. I think we need that. I think it would be James G. And Jim G would be helpful. Yeah, so if Jeff, James G and Rich Mayer could get together and agree, I think we'd be all set. Anyway, thank you all very much. No more songs. <laughs>